Welcome to this module of Professor Messer's free CompTIA Network Plus certification training course, the online training course that tastes great with ketchup or mustard. I'm James Messer, and in this module, we're going to talk about troubleshooting wireless issues. This one's certainly going to be an important one because from the Network Plus certification in 10 004, section 4.7, there's a lot of things we need to learn about whenever we're troubleshooting a wireless network. Everything from the interference to encryption to ESSID mismatches and much more. So we're going to have quite an extensive set of things to look at whenever we're trying to understand how well a wireless network is performing. Let's start our conversation with wireless interference. And this is a very common problem, so it's a good place to start, where there's something outside the scope of our wireless network that's causing a problem for us. Now, wireless interference can be occasionally very predictable. If we turn on a microwave oven, you may find that we're getting a lot of interference. If somebody has a cordless telephone running at 2.4 gigahertz, you may recognize that that's the same frequencies that wireless networks might use. Or if there's a high power source somewhere, you'll see that represented. And you'll, you'll want to know, why is that happening? Sometimes the problem is unpredictable, especially if you're in a building that has multiple tenants, whether it's an environment where it's apartments or whether it's in an office building. Very common these days to have wireless networks. In that office building, if somebody comes in one day and turns on a new access point, there's no way you're going to know about that. It's a different company working in a different part of the building. But let's say they turned it on on exactly the same frequencies that you're using. Well, that might be a little bit more of a problem. And it is completely unpredictable. You never know when something like that might happen. Ideally, we could do some measurements. The screen capture I have here is for a wireless an analysis tool that you can plug in via USB and get statistics over the spectrum on where the different frequencies are, where we're happening, happen to see some of these problems. And relatively inexpensive, only a couple hundred dollars to have something like that. If you'd like to check on your local workstation if you're seeing physical errors, you could look on uh, netstat-e will give you some of those errors. Uh, you can also look at performance monitor to be able to see that. If you're in a Linux environment, it's a netstat-i. Uh, here's an example of when I do netstat-e on my Windows system. And I can see the number of bytes that have sent and received, the number of unicast and non-unicast packets. But the one thing I'm interested in is this errors message. If I'm seeing errors over my wireless network, that might tell me that I'm not able to receive as much traffic as I would expect to receive. And there will probably be some errors just because it is wireless. But you shouldn't see a huge number of errors. So it's worth doing some file transfers. Have a look at what we're seeing there. If we're sitting right under the access point, we should be seeing very few errors there, unless there's something that's interfering with us. If interference isn't your problem and people aren't able to communicate on the network, your issue may be associated with the encryption type that you're using. You need to make sure that all of the devices on your network are using the same encryption type and that they are configured exactly the same way. There's two primary ways of encrypting on wireless networks. One that's not used anymore because it has some cryptographic problems that make it very easy for people to get into these links. It's called Wired Equivalency Privacy, or WEP. Don't use WEP. What you would like to use instead is something called WPA, or Wi-Fi Protected Access. It is a newer type of encryption. And you'll see it represented as WPA or WPA2. WPA was the first generation of this new encryption type. Whenever there was, we found this problem with WEP, we still needed some type of encryption on wireless networks. So the industry very quickly came out with this first generation of WPA that really allowed us to use the same hardware we were using uh, with our WEP type access points. But it used a different encryption method. And it uses something called a temporal key integrity protocol to make sure that that encryption was working properly. Ultimately, we sat back a little bit. We had a little bit of time and came up with what ultimately was the final version of WPA. And to be able to distinguish it from that very quick fix that we did, we call it these days WPA2. It is an IEEE 802.11i amendment. We created it in 2004. So it's been around for quite some time now. It's, it's really uh, withstood the test of time from an encryption perspective. It doesn't use uh, TKIP. It uses AES, or the Advanced Encryption Standard. This is what the US government uses. So they love the ability to run AES on their wireless network. But AES has higher requirements. It uses a little bit more of a 
cryptographic hardware to be able to do this. You need a better processor, if you will, in your access point. And so you may find that if you have a device that was running WPA, it may not be able to use WPA2. Almost everything these days, though, has the latest uh, generation of access points can run WPA2. But if you run into an access point that can only run WEP or WPA, you'll know that's why, because the hardware just wasn't designed to run WPA2. If you're working in an environment with WPA2, you may also see a couple different kinds of WPA2. One is called WPA2 personal mode. And that uses something called a pre-shared key to authenticate, which means if I need to get on this network, I have to give everybody the special word, the special key that I've configured my access point with. So if somebody comes over to my house and, uh, and they want access to my wireless network, oh, I've configured my wireless network. My personal key is this. Make sure you type that in to have access to my network. Well, if you've worked in an environment that's a large enterprise environment, you can't really whisper around to everybody what the password is. That gets rid of all that security that you've been trying to build into your network. So for WPA2, there's also a mode called the enterprise mode that works with some extra servers that do something called 802.1x authentication. You'll see this if you go into the configuration of your wireless card. There's something in there that says use 802.1x. And what this uses is this extensible authentication protocol or EAP. What it does is talk to an external server. In your environment at work, you've probably been given a username and a password to get access to the domain you happen to be a member of, for instance. Well, you can use exactly the same username and password to have access to your wireless network if it's using 802.1x. The 802.1x specification says go out to your authentication server you use for everything else and log in there. And if you've got the rights and permissions to be on the wireless network, it will then grant you permission. So everybody has a different username and password, and yet they all can get access to the wireless network. It really, really helps quite a bit. Now, you have to just have to make sure that the access point encryption and the client encryption will match. If you have WPA2 Enterprise running in your environment, you can't configure your laptop for WPA2 Personal. Those are two different kinds of encryption types. If you're running WEP on your workstation, it's not going to connect to a WPA environment. These things don't work or interoperate with each other at that level. They have to be a perfect match. So you may have to go back to the person who administered the access point and say, how should I configure this workstation? How should I set up my laptop? Should I turn on 802.1x? Should I use my username and password I normally use? And they'll be able to tell you. On wireless networks, you also have this challenge of making sure that you're using all the same frequency as your access point. So the exact channel that you're configuring or that your workstation uses is often determined automatically. Your workstation is set up to find an access point and then determine what channel it's on and use that frequency to be able to communicate to that access point. Now, that's not always the case. There are environments where you might want to manually configure a workstation, a server for a particular channel, even especially when there are multiple access points in the same area so that you're always going to a particular access point on a particular channel. And one thing you'll notice about the frequencies, this is a uh, an image that comes from Wikipedia. It's a great image because it shows that all of the channels that are in wireless actually overlap each other from a frequency perspective. Now, this was done intentionally, but what you'll find is that channels 1, channel 6, and channel 11 don't touch at all. And that's why these are three great channels to use in an environment, because if you're running on channel 1 and another device is running on channel 6, they won't be able to hear each other. There's no overlap there. If you're running an access point on channel 1 and another one on channel 2, you may have some problems there because the, the devices are communicating over this broad range of frequencies, and now they're going to conflict with each other. They're going to get interference from each other, and you want to be able to avoid that. If someone's just not seeing the access point, it may be because there is a mismatch with the service set identifier. This is the ESSID, or what's called the Extended Service Set Identification, and it's configured inside of your access point. The access point, uh, by default, most are configured to broadcast to everybody its existence. So hi, I am access point number one, and anybody who comes inside the range of me can see that I am here and making myself available to the world. You do have the option within your access point to turn that off. Don't let anybody know you're here by default. And in that way, you have to configure your access point to disable the ESSID broadcast. Now, this is not security. Just because you're disabling the broadcast 
doesn't mean that's restricting anybody from using that access point. You could still get the packets of other people going to that access point. You'll find the SSID. It's very easy to do that way through the packets. So don't use this as security. Use it more of a way to provide access or awareness of the access point to a large group of people. You still need to have encryption. You still need to have authentication onto that. This is the configuration for my access point. If I would like to enable or disable my SSID broadcast, I just click a check mark or unclick a check mark, and it will stop broadcasting itself out there to the world. Wireless networks can be challenging to implement. You can have mismatches of standards. The distances are all different. And that's why I put this chart up here, which shows the four major types of wireless networks, 802.11a, b, g, and n. Notice they use different frequencies. They use different throughputs. They send a different amount of traffic over that wireless network. And notice the ranges are also very different. This is an approximation of ranges for these different standards uh, settings. And they all could be different depending on how your environment is. We'll talk about that in a moment. Now, your client machines may have cards inside of them that can communicate on one or more of these standards. So you have to make sure that if you have a card that's running 802.11b and g, and your access point is G, you need to make sure that your workstation is at least configured and turned on to be able to talk over G. If it's only configured to talk over 802.11b, it'll never talk to your G access point. So make sure that your client and your access point are matched up and configured properly. Your access points as well can be configured in similar ways that might be able to support B and G at the same time. And if that's the case, make sure that everybody knows what the access point's configured for and that your workstations are configured to take advantage of how your access point is configured. Here's something you don't have to worry about too much with wired networks, and that is your signal bouncing around and being reflected off different devices. This is really something you do have to really think about for wireless networks. Now, this is not what they call EME, but it's still a bit of a problem. Uh, EME is something called Earth, Moon, Earth. There are amateur radio operators that will take a signal on Earth, they will bounce it off the moon, and listen to that signal somewhere else on Earth. It's very common to do. It's very easy to bounce a, a wireless signal with very, very basic equipment. You don't need a lot of big dishes, a very simple antenna, and some simple radio equipment can bounce it off the moon. So if I can bounce signals off the moon, imagine how the signals are bouncing around inside of your work environment with all your metal filing cabinets and concrete walls and a lot of other things. Usually access points will have multiple antennas on them. And the reason they have multiple antennas is because they can determine where a signal's coming from the strongest. It's sort of like why you have two ears. If you had more than more than two ears, it would be even better for you. But the idea is you can tell where a signal's coming from. You can turn your head to wherever that signal's coming from. If you're hearing a signal bounce, if there's an echo behind you, you could still know, oh, that's a that's a bounce. It's a weaker signal. The main signal's coming from the direction right in front of me. And the way you're able to do that is because you have two ears on your head. So a very similar situation. The access point has more than two antennas or more, and it knows where the signal's coming from. It cleans things up using digital signal processing inside. There's some circuitry and some software that will clean up the signal, a lot like your brain cleans up the signal of an echo, so that you don't have to resend that traffic out over the network. It's really ingenious in the way that it operates. And the idea is that you're going to have reflection no matter what you do. There's going to be signals bouncing around everywhere off copiers and, and metal filing cabinets. It's hard to change those things. You can't really move the copier very easily. You can't really change the layout of your building very easily. So it's nice that your access points are configured to automatically handle a lot of these situations. So let's think about how we would place an antenna. And if we look at the floor plan of a building, we may want to get as much coverage as possible. But how could I cover every single square inch of this floor and put multiple access points in place, but still not have any type of conflict with frequencies? Well, one way to do it is we just overlay this. I can have access points all up in my ceiling at different areas. Notice I'm overlapping just a little bit with these areas so that if there is a little attenuation or things that are blocking some of the signal, I'll at least be able to have a little overlap. And also notice that channels are not overlapping. Channels 1, 6, 11, and 1. Channel 11, 1, and 6. So neither of these single channels are touching each other. It's channel 1, channel 1, channel 1. Channel 6 and channel 6 is over here. And channel 11 and channel 11 is over here. So I know I'm not going to get any conflict with frequencies. And I can also then layer this across my entire floor and make sure that everybody 
everybody has a really nice wireless signal. Let's see what we've learned about troubleshooting wireless issues. Our first question is, which wireless encryption type is recommended for all devices? You can almost remember there's one you don't want to use. The one you do want to use is WPA or WPA2. Our next question, which three 2.4 gigahertz channels do not overlap in the United States? There are some channels that work outside the US that help a little bit, but just for the US, which are the three that we talked about? Well, there's channel one, there's channel six, and there's channel 11. Our last wireless question, what access point capability can minimize the problems associated with bounce and reflection? Something built into our access point, and that was multiple antennas and digital signal processing. Helps a lot whenever we have all those bouncing signals go around our facilities. Well, that covers our section 4.7, where we have learned how to troubleshoot common connectivity issues, and we've gone through each one of these. You should now be very comfortable with the things you're gonna run into if you ever have problems on your wireless network. If you'd like to see many more of our Network Plus videos, you'd like to participate in our message boards, send me a message. You can do all of that on freenetworkplus.com.